Hi, good, good, uh, good evening, buenas noches. Me habla espanol un poquito, not enough to give a whole talk. So I'm going to try. I'm so glad to be here in Barcelona. It's, I was talking uh, beforehand. Uh, I've been on the road for four weeks. Uh, it's been a crazy four weeks. I've been through uh, Turkey and Germany and UK and Madrid and now Barcelona. Barcelona is, is, feels like home to me. Uh, I'm from San Diego, California. And for whatever reason, this feels like the California of Europe uh, in a lot of ways, and I love it here. I also fell in, in more love to the, uh, while I was here uh, with the discovery of the Cagane uh, or the Cagatillo. Uh, there's debate about which one that is. I believe the Tio is the tree. I fell in love with the shitting boy, right? Uh, so I love the idea. I'm walking around the Gothic Quarter, uh, checking things out. And, uh, and I see this little statue, and I'm with my, my friend Bjorn, and, and uh, I say, what is this statue? Uh, this little kid's taking a shit. What's going on? And, and he explains to me, his, his version of it was, oh, it's the little boy like Santa Claus who shits out the gifts. And I said, oh, really? So then I got on Wikipedia and started reading, and it was really, uh, really something different. And then I asked a Catalonian, and she said that, no, actually, it's the... The little boy goes into uh, the uh, nativity, and it kind of means, you know, a little bit of a, a reverence. And also, if you're very famous, it's bringing kind of that famous and, and that authority down to earth. Uh, and I love that concept. And I went, oh, my God, that's a metaphor for my life. I've been a kagane my entire life, uh, shitting on authority. <laughs> and so I hope that a little bit of this is going to shit on the authority of of what we think uh, about businesses and what we think about startups, uh, and I hope you get value. Let me start by a couple of different things uh, that I think are important to say first. Yes, first I am from the United States. I'm sorry for Donald Trump. I don't know what the fuck's going on there. Uh, it's kind of crazy. Please don't blame me. Uh, it's not my fault. Uh, so yes, that's not good. Uh, and number two is that I, I don't believe, I don't call myself and I don't think there are any experts in startups. And the reason that I say that, and, and when it comes to innovation, those sorts of things that aren't experts, is that inherently by the nature of a startup, you can't be an expert in it. You're inherently exploring the unknown. You inherently don't know what the answer is. Therefore, there are no experts. I've been learning about this stuff by trial and error. I've done a lot of work in this area. I mentor tons of startups. I'm an investor in all sorts of things. Um, but I'm no expert. These are my learnings. I hope tonight there's something of value to you, and if there is, take it, steal it, remix it, you have my permission. In fact, you can download the entire talk right here, right now, um, and get my email address, everything that you want to do, please take it, use it. If it doesn't make sense to you, that's okay. If it doesn't really seat with you, it's not going to help your journey and your value creation journey, that's okay too. Like I said, I I'm not uh, married to these concepts, I want to know. And so I appreciate your generosity with your time tonight to spend with me. I appreciate your attention, I appreciate you being here, uh, and I'm so excited to, to jump into this talk. So with those two caveats out of the way, um, oh yeah, and by the way, third caveat, uh, you won't offend me if you pull out your phone and you're on Twitter, I'm at Jeremiah Gardner, please connect, love to connect with you there, take photos of things, take out, uh, stick out, tweet, uh, have fun, be yourself, I love that, be home, I feel home in Barcelona, so be home uh, if you, uh, as we go. <clears throat> so. The premise of all of this is that we're coming out of the industrial age, right? And there's a lot of hangovers in, from the industrial age that have carried over into businesses. And in fact, a lot of large corporations, all of the philosophies and management ways and ways of launching new businesses are really hangovers from the industrial revolution. revolution. They're command and control, right? They're ordered and structured, and they're things that should be predictable and known but we're no longer in the industrial age. And that means that the way that we approach things has to change. And the way that we actually approach new businesses are starting to change. And that has a huge impact. And what I've started to observe as I, as I have the pleasure and, and the amazing uh, kind of uh, ability at this point to travel around the world is that there's a new way of thinking that's coming out of folks like you. By the way, how many of you are startup founders? Just out of curiosity, started your awesome. 
How many of you are thinking about it? And that's why maybe you're here. Okay, awesome. First time founders, amazing. I'm so glad that you're here tonight. And how many of you uh, say, fuck that startup thing, I think I'm gonna do uh, corporations, anybody? Uh, okay, good, no, it's all good. I work with a lot of corporate I'll, I'll start, entrepreneurs. After a startup. After, after a startup, game. yes, yeah. Okay. Just get acquired, right, yeah. exactly, yeah. Easy, easy game. And what I've seen is folks like you, first time entrepreneurs, people that have started their businesses, intrapreneurs inside of large organizations. It's a group of people that know, have kind of rejected what I would call the wealth creation economy. And that is, I'm only in it to make money. Mm -hmm. right? And in the wealth creation economy, those that won were those that could produce the most. That's why we have huge factories that could overproduce, that could basically eat like a large alligator all the rest of the competition because I can win because I can produce the most and have the best distribution. So wealth creation mindset. And groups of people like yourselves all around the world have rejected this mindset and have said, no, I actually think it's about the creation of value for other people. And that wealth actually follows, or money follows value, it's not the other way around. And I'm, I kind of think about this as the value creation economy, right? That we're on the forefront of this wave of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, of artists and small business owners, of <coughs> artisans and all sorts of folks that are riding this first kind of wave of what, what we're seeing to be the value creation economy. And I think it's a really important movement, and I think it's a very powerful one when we dig kind of below the surface. And I think that the mindset then, from command and control and those that can produce the most and so on and so forth, has shifted. It's no longer about command, control, predictability, and scale, but instead it's moved to kind of this art and science. Right? That the value creation is both the inspiration we gain from one another and the empathy that we gain and the rigor that we apply to the ideas that we have and the learnings that we gain. Right somewhere in the middle of that is where the magic of value happens, in my view and what I've been doing. And so this evening, I want to kind of talk through three traits of that mindset, of that art and science that I've observed that I think value creators around the world are starting to embrace. And I think that if you're on that journey, the more that you can turn these practical ideas into practices, the stronger that your potential for value creation becomes. Cool? Sound good? Mm -hmm. Anyone opposed to that journey? Good. So, mindset of, a, of great value creators. And the first one that, that I've really seen is that great value creators see the world differently. Now, when I say that, you might immediately think, of course, Startup founders and artists are visionaries. And you may say, of course, I'm a visionary. I'm here tonight to tell you, you aren't, right? <laughs> There's no such thing as a visionary, or at least the myth that we build around visionaries is that there's a lone wolf entrepreneur in his garage somewhere, tinkering away until one moment he gets it and he goes, Eureka, I've got it. And he walks outside of that garage and says, look world, what I have. And all the masses flock to him and he's a billionaire, right? That's kind of the value creation myth that, that Brent Cooper wrote about. It's also the, the myth of the visionary. Instead of what I mean when I say that entrepreneurs see the world differently is that they see opportunity in the world and the way that they see that opportunity is actually through the eyes of somebody else. Now this is a really important point that when entrepreneurs and value creators and entrepreneurs look at the world, they don't look at it solely from their perspective. They begin to see it through the eyes of someone else. They begin to see the opportunities in the problems that other people have, and they begin to explore the world not from their perspective, but from someone else's perspective. Another way of putting this is that great value creators actually lead with empathy. They start with that <laughs> empathy. And empathy means that we experience another's perspective. I love this photo. Mm -hmm. I have a year and a half old daughter. It's been an incredible journey to becoming a father. I miss her immensely after all this, these trips. Uh, and I have been very, very careful with my language around having a baby because I didn't have the baby. Very, 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 very truthful, my wife had the baby and I was there. In fact, I can never 
have the empathy and the experience, and no man can yet, except for Arnold Schwarzenegger in that one movie that was terrible, <laughs> I don't remember, Mr. Dad or something where he was pregnant with Danny DeVito, I think. Gross. We could never actually have that experience. We, we don't know what it's like to be pregnant. And women, you don't know what it's like to be in the you know where's. It hurts, okay? <laughs> But the empathetic choice is to try and put on that weight. And these three guys are out of London. And no, the first, in they're in Barcelona? Yeah, I worked there. No way, are you kidding? <laughs> I've heard the story that it's from London, no? No, no, they're here in Barcelona. They're from Barcelona. Yeah. Bar Catalonians or no? No, they're English, but they work here. Ah, that's where my wires get crossed. English guys living in Barcelona, <laughs> right? Actually tr had a whole project to put on the weight that their wives were gaining as they were pregnant, right? It's the empathetic choice. It's the viewing the world through another's eyes. But it's a difficult choice. And I don't want to say that it's just simply have empathy. Because empathy inherently means I have to become vulnerable. And that's why so many entrepreneurs don't do it. So so many entrepreneurs fall in love with their idea without ever learning that there's a problem in the world without ever talking to another human being that might experience that problem. is because when I say I want to lead with empathy, it means that I have to then open myself up and listen. Empathy means we connect deeply with something inside of ourselves that our customers are experiencing. It's actually a, a personal memory or a personal feeling or emotion that we have to then dig up deep within ourselves in order to experience the world through somebody else's eyes. And great value creators lead with that empathy because they're choosing to be vulnerable and experience the world through someone else's eyes. Startup death equals a solution searching for a problem. And there are too many pieces of technology and apps. There are too many solutions in the world that are not solving someone's problem. They're just nice pieces of technology. And if you want to create value in this world, and you want to actually create value for another human being, you have to start with the foundation of empathy. And you have to start with a choice, which is vulnerable, to experience somebody else's perspective deeply. Walt Disney, one could argue, is, is one of the greatest value creators that we've ever known in the world. Uh, yes, I grew up in California. Yes, Disneyland's a huge deal. And yes, it's way too damn expensive but I will continue to pay the money because I love it. <laughs> but there's this great story about Walt Disney before he actually launched Disneyland and built it, that he noticed at the World Fair, which was kind of the inspiration for Disneyland, there was trash everywhere. Garbage, litter, people were throwing on the ground. And this is Walt Disney, he said, that, I don't understand why people just throw their trash on the ground in this great location. And so as he looked around, it kind of reminds me if you've ever seen the movie Charlotte's Web. There's a character in Charlotte's Web, or read the book, named Templeton, the rat. And he has a great song that he runs around singing about all the garbage that's left at the fair. Well, this is what Walt Disney observes while he's at the fair. He's there. He sees it all. And he looks around, and now he's Walt Disney. He can hire a market research firm. He can tell his underlings to go and figure out why there's trash everywhere. He can do a number of things to figure out how he won't have trash at Disneyland when it launches. But Disney makes a decision, an empathetic one, a vulnerable one, to then understand and observe. And so he goes to a number of fairs around the world. And he starts to look at people, and he realizes people just kind of throw their trash on the ground. And so then he starts to count the steps. He says, I wonder how many steps someone carries their garbage before they throw it on the ground. <laughs> he starts to look at the steps, and he's watching people walk around. He's watching what they're doing. And on average, he notices that about, people will take about 15 steps before they throw their litter on the ground and walk away. Now, it's a pretty cool insight. It sounds like good data that you can take action from. But Walt then could go and say, OK, we're, we're going to make sure no one throws trash. We're going to have our police at Disneyland that are obviously under the ground mate, watching people. And when they get to that 15th step, they watch them really closely. <laughs> they throw that trash on the ground. We get them, right? But no, he says, I, I don't get it. Why? So what does he do? He walks up, he puts on the weight of his customers, and he orders a hot dog and some popcorn, eats it, 
and has the trash in his hands, starts walking around and says, gets to his 15 steps and he goes, ah, there's no trash can. No wonder they throw it on the ground. I don't even see a trash can. I've been walking around for 30 steps. And so that level of empathy of something as small as throwing a piece of garbage away has led to the fact that today, in any Disney-owned property, you can't walk 15 steps without finding a trash can, right? And that's why there's no trash on the ground. Yes, there's people cleaning it up, but because of the empathetic choice that Disney made to experience his customer's perspective led to that idea. Now, there's a million concepts of, around empathy, and I don't want to drive the point too far home, but the point is that great value creators see the world through their customers' eyes. They start there. They understand that that's the foundation. And if they're ever going to be successful at the value that they hope to create, the first point, the starting point, is to see the world through someone else's eyes. And that doesn't start with everybody. Well, it actually starts with one person. And so I want to challenge you tonight. It's not about how do I have empathy for everybody. It's not how do I gain empathy for the world, or how do I gain empathy for my entire market segment? My question to you to think deeply about tonight and then take action on is what one person do you need more empathy for? For those of you that raised your hand that said, I'm thinking about starting a startup, who do you hypothesize as the customer? What problem do you think they have? And who do you need to gain more empathy for? For those of you that are already in business, how do you look at your email list that you have and gain empathy? Who do you need to gain more empathy for? And that's why I say the most powerful tool in your <coughs> toolbox when it comes to value creation is a cup of coffee. And what I mean by that is a cup of coffee with a customer. And if you haven't committed to doing that, it's really difficult to understand the problem the customer is having. And it makes it really difficult to build a solution that will work. And it makes it really difficult to understand the market that that solution will actually grow in. And so the beginning, the foundation, is that empathy. And so I want you to think about it right now. I don't want you to just listen to me and go, oh, that was nice, cool. I want you to think, of who's the one person? What's their name? Can you visualize their face? And then if you have a notebook or a phone or whatever it would be, write that name down. Seriously, write it down as the phone rings. <laughs> or no, that's not the phone. Yes, that's the, that's the ghost saying, have empathy for me. Who's that one person? Maybe you need to think about it a little bit. But who is it? And then what are you going to do about it? When I meet with entrepreneurs around the world, the first thing I ask them is to see their calendar. You want me to be your mentor? Let me see your calendar. I said, really? Yeah. Because I know if you prioritize empathy, I know if you prioritize your customers, because it will show up in your calendar. So if I asked you right now, let me see your calendar, do you have two hours a week blocked off just to be with customers? Just to listen and to understand? Just to gain the empathy that you need in order to be successful at creating value for them? I'd venture to say no. And that means that there's a tweak in the way that we have to approach the value that we want to create. Now, when we go out and gain empathy, there's a million ways to do it. We can observe, like Disney did, and call it a customer safari, and observe them, our customers in the wild. <laughs> we can uh, go to an airport. This is one of my favorite techniques. Go to an airport. They're not going anywhere. Go a little early for your next flight. Just start talking to people. Strike up conversations. Right? We can do interviews. We can do ride-alongs. We can host meetups. This may be one big empathy experiment right? Uh, for Mike. You better look out. If he's, talk he's asking you a bunch of questions afterwards, that's really what this is about. right? But what do we do when we get in front of a customer? Often entrepreneurs go, do you like this? Isn't it awesome? Isn't it amazing? Would you use it? Yeah, you would? Well, how much would you pay for it? $30, 30 oh, awesome, I'm going to go build it, right? <laughs> what did I just ask her to do? To imagine my product. To imagine a scenario in which she would use it. Imagine what she would actually pay for it. She's actually tapping into a piece of her mind that's, that's the imagination. But imagine instead that we're working on, let's say, a new travel app. And I said, when was the last time you, you traveled? You have an answer? Uh, I cannot remember right now. 
and can't remember. What about you? When's the last time you traveled? Um, I went to uh, Alicante on the train. Okay, on the train. Great. And what about you, Mike? When's the last time you traveled? Uh, in August, went to France and Tenerife. Great. Did you fly? Did you take the train? Did you? I drove to France and I took. I flew to Tenerife. Great. And did you rent a car or what did you do? Rented a car in Tenerife car. and here to drive to France. Great. You see the difference? He's not imagining. He's actually giving me the facts of what happened. And I'm able to understand his behavior through those facts. Granted, they're colored, right? Uh, who knows what kind of car it was? We can keep on going deeper into it. But I'm understanding what really happened rather than putting hypotheticals and if questions mm -hmm. in front of them. And it's a fantastic change to the way that you approach the way you listen rather than speak to your customers. All of this is wrapped up in empathy. And the challenge is to start with one. Who's that one person you need coffee with? Who's that one person you're going to buy dinner to listen to? And who do you need more empathy for in your life? That's the foundation of value creation. The second thing that, that I've noticed is that great value creators choose to take action. Now, what I mean by this is that there's a lot of people in the world that have a long list of things that other people need to fix, <laughs> right? You know, someone should do something about those potholes. Someone should do something about the airport. Gosh, traffic is so terrible. Someone should do that. Man, I wish someone would invent something that, that you know, uh, made my back feel better, right? We have a long list of things that other people should fix, not me. Great value creators look around and go, man, this problem sucks, and I see that a bunch of other people have it. Who's fixing it? You're going to fix You know what? I got it. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I have no idea how I'm going to code it, but I got it. I raise my hand and I choose to take action. And in that decision, we make a strong decision to act. And here's the crazy thing. For most of us, it happens like that. For those of you that have jumped off that cliff of entrepreneurship, right, you can probably trace back to when you made the decision to become an entrepreneur, when you made the decision to found your company. It was a decision like this. One night you're sitting at home, you said, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm leaving my job and I'm going to do it. And your life has never been the same before, a sense, right? It's never been the same sense. Right? So the ha decision happens like that. What <laughs> takes a long time is all of the excuses we have about not, why not to do it and all the reasons that we find that someone else should solve it. So great value creators make the decision to act in an instant. And that decision means that they're embracing inherently the unknown. And it's unknown to us because we're trying to create new value. We're trying to create something that hasn't been in the world before. And we're trying to impact someone else's life. Let me drive the point home a little bit further. How many of you have ever written a business plan in this room? Anybody? Wow, lots of business plans. Congratulations, you're a fiction writer, just like myself. Actually, I'll pause there before. Did any of your business plans become 100% true? What you wrote materialized in the world. Anybody? Really? You need to get up and leave. You have a better future as a fortune teller or a soothsayer than you do as an entrepreneur. Every word I've written in the business plan was bullshit. Why? Because I can't predict the future. And as a human being, I can't, I can't look into my crystal ball and tell you what's going to happen. A few weeks ago, I was in, in London. Entrepreneurs that have built their business in London are now reeling from a vote called Brexit. It's crazy. It's crazy. They can't predict that. You can't put that on a business model canvas. You can't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's unknown. So therefore, the decision to act is a decision to embrace the unknown. The way that I like to describe entrepreneurship is this. Imagine this room completely dark. I mean, like you close the hotel shades, dark. Dark, 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 right? That's what it's like when you step out to make that decision as an entrepreneur. And the whole game, the whole thing, the whole embracing and decision to act is this, is lighting the next candle. You start by lighting one candle, and it illuminates your next step, and you take that next step. OK, where should I go next? Well, I'm going to illuminate this candle, and I'll go over here. Oh, shit, there's alligators over here. Don't want to go there. Uh, they want to go this way. OK, boom, go this way. And the whole thing 
is about learning our way iteratively through the unknown. Now, some people say, well, I have a vision to change the world. The world's going to be different. My vi- I have to live into my vision. And part of the problem with that is that a vision can only kind of point you like a compass. It can only tell you where north is. It doesn't tell you about the swamps and the hills and the mountains mm-hmm. and, the, and the monsters that are in front of you. So the truth is, is that the decision to act, the decision to embrace the unknown, is a decision to an adventure. It's a call to adventure. It's a call to learning. And great value creators understand that. These are my friends at the Happy Startup School in Brighton. I got a chance <laughs> while I was out on this trip. A guy in the red's name is Carlos. Another guy in blue is named Lawrence. And these guys were very, very successful developers. They had a development app studio, building all kinds of cool apps for startups called Spook Studio. And as they're building these things, and as they're meeting with all these entrepreneurs, and as they're doing all of this stuff, they come through empathy, connection with the customer, understanding them deeply, to understand that all of the questions we ask about entrepreneurship, like, what's the plan, right? What's your MMR? If anyone's in the startup right now, you know that, the answer to that question. What's the market size? We all say, oh, it's huge. People that live and breathe, right? Ask any first time entrepreneur, Who's your market? They say what? Everyone, Everyone, right? Anyone that breathes, of course. You go, oh, rookie, right? Well, they start to understand that these questions that we ask about entrepreneurship are are good questions, but did anyone stop to ask the entrepreneur, are you happy? Does what you're doing make you happy? And so they started asking that question one by one of these entrepreneurs, and they found out that it was a metric that the entrepreneur wasn't even measuring that they had left their corporate job and gone off on this journey, tried to practice empathy, got down the road, and were terribly unhappy because they'd been pushed around on what they were supposed to do. (coughs) And so they made the decision to act. They raised their hand and embraced the unknown. They left a successful development studio behind. In fact, Spook Studios just closed a couple weeks ago and founded the Happy Startup School that inherently asked the question, are you happy? And I've been building a community around the world of entrepreneurs that are asking that question and supporting one another in the ventures that they're choosing to create. And I think it's an amazing kind of case study in the ability to make the decision to embrace the unknown. They have no idea how they're going to sustain and pay the bills. They have no idea if that community is going to be large enough to actually make a dent in the world. They have no idea whether or not there's a business here but they're following the evidence, and they're following the empathy, and they've risen their hands to act and are learning their way through it. And I'm happy to report, I was with them a couple of weeks ago in Brighton, I love that city. I was told that people that leave London go to cities that start with B, Brighton, <laughs> Berlin, <laughs> Bristol, Barcelona. Yes, Barcelona. I was in Barton, <laughs> Brighton, absolutely love it, and I'm happy to report they're doing really well. Community's growing immensely, Uh, They are actually making enough money to sustain. They've expanded into India, and they're expanding into the U.S. next year. Amazing, right? Because they're following that decision to act and embracing the unknown. This is what it looks like in the real world. When you embrace the unknown, you actually have to operate in the unknown, which means you've got to go out and try stuff. It means you've got to go out and learn. And the key point here is that we prioritize our adventure, our journey, over where we end up. I love this quote that says, what you become is more important than where you end up. And so the journey is the most important piece. If you're a first-time entrepreneur, I don't want to blow smoke up your ass and tell you you lies. The truth is you're likely to fail. If you're a second-time entrepreneur, The truth is, statistically, you're likely to fail. It's not about following your passion and build a great team and have a great idea. All of that's bunk. It's bad self-help entrepreneurship, in my view. The truth is, it's hard work. It's difficult. And the chances of real success are slim. But the entrepreneurs that prioritize the journey over the destination end up learning their way 
into something that creates real value. It may not be a, a unicorn, a billion dollar startup. Mm -hmm. It may not be a million dollar startup. But if you want to create value, when you prioritize that value over money, then you're willing to go on the journey and make decisions as you go. And so I think the second thing that great value creators do is they raise their hand and decide to act. They make that decision, they step out into the unknown, and they embrace that journey. And then the final thing that I've observed is that great value creators assume they're wrong. Now, this is a tough one. For most of us, we fall in love with our idea, and we start by assuming we're right. This is where we start to describe our ventures as like, it's the Uber for toilets, right? <laughs> or it's the Uber for showers, or it's the Airbnb for cell phones, right? Because we assume we're right. Everyone else was right there. I could build that. I'm right. I'm good enough. It's an ego-led thing that we are correct. And great value creators have learned that everything they think they know is likely an assumption. And if they can't prove that assumption true or false, then there's no point in pursuing the idea. So when you start from the perspective that you're wrong, you begin to prioritize learning over execution. It's huge. There's a phrase that's been floating around the startup world called fail fast. Mm -hmm. And I hate this phrase with everything <laughs> I have. Because entrepreneurs are starting to wear it on their sleeve as some sort of badge of honor. And to me, failure isn't the goal, nor is mass, mass, massive, massive success. The goal early in any new venture is learning. And we learn in our failures, and we learn in our small successes. And so instead, it's about learning fast, prioritizing that learning above all else, above our egos, above what we think is going to happen, above executing a plan above what we put on the sticky note that goes on our business model canvas. When we prioritize the learning, we begin to understand the world from the eyes of the perspective, and we begin to deal with the evidence that's on the ground rather than our opinions. Too often, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs and value creators around the world waste so much time sitting in meetings arguing over assumptions. And often, those meetings the one thing that makes the decision in that meeting is what I would call the hippo. Anyone familiar with this phrase? The highest paid person's opinion, right? <laughs> hippo. Well, he's the co-founder, of course he's right. And the co-founder goes, yes, I'm the co-founder, of course I'm right, right? And what evidence is none other than I have a gut feeling. I always find it hilarious when someone walks up and says, well, I have an intuition, and, I said, and an ego, <laughs> right? <laughs> Because your intuition isn't evidence. Your intuition isn't known. Your ego isn't evidence. It isn't known. And if your business decisions about how you create value in the world are driven solely by your ego and intuition, you're going to have a tough road. Because the evidence may be flying in the face of your intuition, and you will ignore it time and time again because you believe you're right. So value creators and startup founders that have been there start with the assumption that they're wrong. And they want to prove themselves wrong as quickly as possible, rather than to go into the world and prove themselves right. Food on the Table is a startup. Actually, they just got acquired by the Food Network, uh, which, which is amazing. Congratulations, out of Austin, Texas. And the founder, Emmanuel, is a friend of mine. And, and he had left the corporation and wanted to start a business and, and felt like there was a problem with Shopping. In the U.S., we, we shop for things, you know, weeks at times. Uh, other than, I think, in Europe, it's kind of a daily practice. For us, it's a weekly, sometimes even uh, bi-weekly, and for those big Costco shoppers, like a monthly thing, right? And so we felt like, man, what ends up happening is we waste a ton of food in the U.S. And that's because we buy, let's say, an onion. And the recipe calls for half an onion. And we don't know what to do with the other half of that onion, so we leave it in the refrigerator. It wilts, it dies, it stinks, we scrub it out, and we throw it away. And so the food waste comes from not understanding how to utilize and shop for meal planning for the week. So you can imagine the app that they thought would be successful. 
You can imagine all the assumptions about that being right. Sounds like a pretty logical problem to solve to me. But instead, he assumed he was wrong. He said, you know what? This is not going to work. There's no way in heck a shopping list is going to work. So instead, I need to go out and learn. And he put himself, he, put, he embedded himself with a few different folks that were responsible for their shopping, for their household. And he said, hey, I just want to learn about your habits, about what you do. Can I go shopping with you? And he would follow them around the supermarket. And he would watch what they did. And he's taking notes. And he would go away. He would look at everything they did. He would find recipes. It's a concierge experiment. He'd bring them back to those folks he was connected with. Say, hey, you could try these different recipes. That's what works for your ingredients. And hey, if you were to optimize the way that you went shopping and did it this way, you could actually get a little bit more out of that olive oil you bought and out of that uh, you know, chicken that you, you put on in the freezer. OK. And so they'd go shopping again the next week. And they would optimize the list, and they would figure out what to do. And he did this for three months. Eventually, he asked those folks, hey, can I go shopping for you? I'm going to optimize the whole thing for you and see if you can't use all these ingredients. And what he found, the evidence on the ground, is that when you optimize these sorts of things from a deep perspective of empathy, you reduce the food waste by over 80%. Oh my gosh, well, this is great from a concierge perspective. Do we just build this as a startup or do I build an app? By nature, he's a software developer. He said, no, I actually need to go out and get people that will go shopping for the first two or three weeks with, with people to teach them about this stuff that can then maybe translate into an app or maybe a platform or not. But the next step, the riskiest assumption, is that I can build enough people that will go out and be experts in shopping. He started to build that. And as his idea progressed, at every turn, he tried to prove himself wrong. I want to know why this wouldn't work. And as he progressed, it just kind of lit those candles and illuminated the room around food on the table. And today, they've been acquired by Food Network. Amazing. Congratulations to him, based on the evidence he's produced. So. Dealing with what the reality is and assuming we're wrong is what drives strong startup success. And it looks something like this. When you assume you're right, you try and execute your way through your startup plan. You make these plans and decks. You do all these sorts of you know, hand-wringing and meetings and arguments about assumptions. And you make this plan that's going to get you from A to B. But when you assume you're wrong, you actually start with what's the riskiest assumption we're making? What, if it's not true, sinks my business completely? Which one is that? And when we're able to identify that, we're able to triangulate our way through our learning. Because we're searching rather than executing. We're discovering rather than trying to sell. It's a fundamental shift in the way that we approach how we build a startup. So my challenge to you is, what's the biggest assumption you're making? What's the assumption that if it's not true, you're sunk? And how, what are you going to do to start learning about it? What's the next thing that you can do tomorrow to start learning, rather than next week, or next year, or when your funding comes in? Assuming you're wrong is powerful, and most great value creators do it. So great value creators see the world differently. Great value creators choose to take action. And great value creators assume that they're wrong. And this applies across the board. And the wonderful people that I've gotten a chance to meet across the world that are riding this new wave of value creation. And so I want to close with a, with a quick, very personal story and introduce you to Petro. <laughs> Petro is an 8-bit jellyfish. And he is what we would call an MVP of a startup that we've founded. And I'll tell you the story from top to finish, tell you where we are. If you can solve it better, take the idea. It's yours. Uh, first, you've got to sign some NDA. No, I'm just kidding. No NDAs. <laughs> so myself and a couple colleagues have this problem with PowerPoints and presentations. And that problem that we have 
is that version control and collaboration are a mess. PowerPoint sucks. Keynote's great for design, but sucks at everything else. Google Slides is wonderful for version, wonderful for, for oh, it's a hard one to get up. Wonderful for version control, terrible for design. If you just smash those three things together, and, well, actually, leave PowerPoint completely out, but you smash the other two together, you might have a useful tool, but it doesn't integrate into any of the existing tools that I use, like Google Drive, Slack, Dropbox, and so on and so forth. So this problem drove us nuts. And it actually was costing us a lot because the latest learnings in the last deck that we were teaching got buried in someone else's machine or buried on Dropbox. And I never saw them. So when I went out to do the next engagement, I used the old deck. And oh, and the new one changed into this. Well, where's the new one? Well, it's version 17.743 with my last name in it. Where the hell is that? And we started to actually lose learnings that we were gaining simply based on the storage and version control of our decks, driving us, not, driving us nuts. So we went searching, and we said, someone has to have solved this. Some startup has to have seen this problem and solved it. And we tried everything you can possibly imagine that was out there. Prezi, all the new ones, slide.es. We tried all sorts of plugins for Drive and for, uh, for PowerPoint and for Google Slides. We tried everything to try and solve this problem. We created these processes internally to try and get it fixed. And still, just today, I got pinged, where's the latest blah, blah, blah? Ah! <laughs> and so we decided, like entrepreneurs do, that we would do something about it. We made the decision to act. That no one else is going to do it. We want to do it. Let's go. But instead of founding a company and writing a business plan, what I would consider a bunch of waste, we said, we're not doing anything until we confirm that this is actually a problem with other people other than ourselves. So we set a bar, 100 customer interviews in the next 45 days before we make a move on anything. And that's what we did. Each one of us took 33.3. Actually, that's not necessarily true. Our CTO took like 20. You know, getting CTOs out and talking to human beings is, <laughs> is a difficulty. And the other two of us took a few more. We went out and started talking to people. We listened. When was the last time you tried to collaborate on decks? How do you store your presentations? What's the latest version of your pitch deck? What's the latest version of your education deck? What do you do when you try to collaborate with your colleagues on this? What happens? And all we did, very, very simple, you can replicate this very easily, is we used a Google form that as we're talking to people, we filled it out, that aggregated all our results. We got together at the end of that. We, we hit it, 100 interviews. But the, together at the end of those 45 days, we just threw it up on the screen, scrolled through. What do we see as common threads? And what we saw was, wow, this problem exists in, in education. Educators use PowerPoints and decks and try to share them with each other, and it's a problem. This problem exists in government when they try and go out and do presentations to each other and to the communities and so on and so forth. It exists. Oh, this problem exists between marketing and sales teams in large organizations. This problem exists in medium-sized startups. This problem exists with first-time founders. This problem exists with startups or with uh, consultants. Holy crap, there's problems everywhere here. A little overwhelming. I've never scratched on a problem that was that big. So then I can say, oh, first-time entrepreneur, who's your market? Everybody, yeah, because they all do really, at some level, have the problem. But then we had to make a decision. Well, we knew that large organizations are hard to sell into, and they spend millions of dollars on PowerPoint trainings still today. It's a hard market to tackle. And we knew that their proof of MVP was going to be pretty darn high. Right? It has to be a pretty well-baked product in order to get into a large organization. And if we went with consultants, we knew that consultants, yes, they use decks every day, but they're not going to fall in love with it. And we don't have a big network there. Well, I said, I have a huge network with startups. So do you. So do you. Startup founders are pretty OK with shitty products at first. So hey, let's start learning there. But before we do, we need 50 more interviews. Off we went, interviewing founders. And what we found was most founders store their decks on Google Drive. Most founders, as they grow, the problem starts to get really, really intense. Early on, it's just on my machine. Whatever my taxonomy and my naming taxonomy is, I can live with it. 
But as it grows beyond them and their co-founder, or they hire their first marketing person, or they have their first intern, boom, they all of a sudden have the problem. And so we took those learnings. We locked ourselves in a house for three days in Austin, with rules, by the way. We can go out once, and it can't be for dinner. That was the rule, right? So we can go for breakfast, we can go for lunch, but we don't want to go for dinner because we knew we'd just go off to the bar and have drinks and have fun, and then all of a sudden it would be late and we didn't do the work. So we locked ourselves in the room for, for three days. We had no idea what we were going to come out, and out came Petro. Because we asked ourselves the question, what could we do now to start learning? What could we build in the next three days to start learning about the way that decks are, are stored and if there's really a problem here? So Petro is simple. It's not a full solution. It's not a painkiller. It's simply an experiment to start to learn. All Petro can do is Petro is a Slack bot. I don't know if you use Slack. Anyone in the room use Slack? Yep. That's what we heard as well in our interviews. Lots of Slack. Petro is simply a Slack bot. All you can do with Petro is tell Petro to track a deck that you've put on Google Drive. You can't use it on Dropbox yet. You can't use it on Box. It's just Drive. You tell Petro, hey, follow that deck. And whenever an update's made to that deck, he tells that channel. And users can go in and say, hey, what's the latest version of blah? Ask Petro, and Petro will go find it for him on Drive. That's it. And all we really want to learn is do people really update their, their decks on Drive, or do they just rename them? And do they really track them over time to understand the versions that they have so that it keeps them organized? That's all we want to learn. Took us three days to build. Right now, the bottleneck is Slack has to approve it. So they're actually, we've actually outsourced our bug testing because they're testing it all right now and nice. letting us know whether or not it's going to be approved. If we come back and fix a few things, send it back to them. Right? We don't even have to do any of that. And it took us three days. And so the reason that we went this direction and that we built Petro is that I actually want to prove to myself why I shouldn't do this. I have a hell of a lot to lose. It may mean that. I don't get to write my next book. It may mean that I have to leave the company that I'm helping build and grow that I love. It may mean for my co-founder, he built the, the most successful Nike football app ever. He may have to leave that behind. It may mean for, for my other co-founder that he has to sell all of his stock in his other startup because he has a technical non-compete. It means a lot. We lose a lot if we go, we're going to found this, go for it without any empathy, without any evidence, without any decision about what we need to learn and prove ourselves wrong. So we assume we're wrong. We assume we're going to fail. And we want to prove to ourselves as quickly as possible why we shouldn't build this. And the same is true for you. You have a lot to lose in building the wrong thing. Not just your time, not just your reputation, but also your spirit. That entrepreneurial spirit gets tamped down when we get beat time and time again. You have a lot to lose when it comes to your family. You have a lot to lose when it comes to the value that you might have created had you just stopped for a minute to practice these things. And so who knows? That's where we are. Probably going to fail. We've accepted it completely. But that's where we're at in the journey. And we'll figure out what works. And so my challenge to you is this. I want you to think as big as possible and think about the biggest value that you can possibly create in this world. But I want you to start small. I want you to start with the next step, to start with that empathetic choice, that vulnerable choice to have coffee. Mm -hmm. I want you to start with that next thing you need to learn. I want you to start by assuming that you're wrong and experimenting to prove yourself right. That's what drives value creation. That's what's driving change in the world. And that's what I think will propel your journey forward. So if you found value in this, this is the URL for you to download the talk uh, and to get it yourself. Um, and I thank you so much for your time. I'd love to open it up to, for a few questions. But, but thank you for your generosity with your time and being here tonight. Thank you.